Proverbs 11, in uh, verse 15, we're continuing book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, all the way through the Bible. And so verse 15, you're going to notice, is one of those verses that we've already read back in chapter 6. And then we're going to already read it again when we get to chapter 17, because we will have already seen it in 6 and 11. And uh, it's, it's neat the way that Solomon writes this. If we take heed of our, of our ways, according to Solomon's Proverbs, we gain knowledge and we gain discretion. I, I need the knowledge. I need to know what to do in situations. I also need discretion. I need wisdom to know how to use the knowledge. Just because you know how to do something doesn't mean you know how to do it in the right way, with the right timing, with the right sensitivity. Depending upon who you're sharing with or what you're doing, the Lord knows those people's needs too and wants to guide and direct. But uh, Christ speaks to us. A greater than Solomon is here to speak to us now. And he speaks to us through his word. He is the wisdom of God, and he's made to us wisdom. The purpose of this book, and, and you've started to notice this, I'm sure, is to fix firmly in our minds repeatedly, frequently, forcefully repeating things, forceful repetition of the virtues that are taught throughout the Bible. Over and over and over again, uh, the Bible in various forms and diverse methods, God has supplied to man an abundance of instruction so that we'll never be able to stand before the throne of God and say, hey, nobody told me, I didn't know, or I had never heard that kind of things. He does not want anyone to have an excuse for missing the mark. Now, the thing that Solomon does in the book of Proverbs, it's not expressed like it is when Moses teaches. Moses is always a, thus saith the Lord. Solomon's more like, hey, look, I know what thus the Lord said, and so I thought I'd try it out, see how it worked. And I found out with experience that, hey, the things Moses said were right, he was right. And the things that Moses said that uh, were not right, and I found out they're not right. <laughs> I tried it out. I've had the experience. I tested it, and I'm amazed at this man who could test. He had the ability to test everything that was available in the world. I mean, uh, let's just start with the marriage, shall we? <laughs> 700 wives. Now, I know that a lot of men are not stupid enough to say anything here, but <laughs> when we're by ourselves, we say, come on, one's enough. <laughs> you know? What do you do with 700 wives and 300 concubines? Then I think about how often you get to spend time with your wife. Right. Well, I'll see you once every three years, and hopefully I'll remember your name. I'm sure I'll have somebody that'll cue me or clue me in. Remember her? It was last uh, June, three years ago. <laughs> you guys had a picnic? We did? Oh, yeah. Do we have any kids? <laughs> you know. Then the money. Unlimited funds to do whatever he wanted. You want to build a big building? Let's do it. You want to put in pools? Great. You want to put in fields? Wonderful. You want to go on a vacation? You want to travel? Great. You want the nicest chariot in the world? Wonderful. I was just reading about his throne again the other day. <laughs> it's ivory, but you'd never know it because he overlaid the entire thing with gold. And then he put lions on each of the six steps, right? And lions in the back and a, and a big half moon thing, all of gold. It's like, there's, and it says in the Bible, there was never any throne like this and probably never has been since then either. But uh, he had the opportunity. You want to you wanna get into music? Let's not just go to a concert. Let's hire the best bands to play in your living room. Okay? Let's have them over to our house. But first of all, you got to have a house big enough to have a band and invite your you know, 500 closest friends to the concert at your house in your living room. And, of course, you're going to feed everybody, too. The Queen of Sheba was blown away by the amount of food uh, and his servants and his, you know, most kings have a cupbearer and his cupbearers, multitudes of them. And she goes, man, I heard about you. I came to see if it was true, and they didn't even tell me half of it. So he had the resources, he had the ability, and he took advantage of that to try out everything he could. 
And he's going to write about that. He did in the Proverbs. He's going to write about it again in uh, uh, Ecclesiastes. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Think about that word for a while. It means soap bubbles. It's nothing you can grasp, nothing you can keep. It might look good, but try to grab a hold of it and it goes away. Okay? So uh, he, he supplies through experience not only what he knew through the word that Moses had written, but what he had experienced. And he, uh, he wants men to live so that they have no excuse to miss the mark. So uh, Moses said, these are the commandments of God. Solomon says, I checked it out. And this is what is best for mankind, what Moses has already told us. And the essence of human wisdom is keeping God's commandments. So verse 15, he who is surety for a stranger will suffer. But one who hates being surety is secure. We discussed surety ship again back in chapter 6. Surety ship is an old English King James word for co-signing. And uh, uh, it's to promise to pay the debts for somebody else. I will take upon myself your debts. I will pay your debts for you. Now, when somebody co-signs, they're usually saying, I'm going to pay, but will you back me up? The bank won't give me the loan unless somebody backs me up. Why does the bank want to back up? Because the, the bank doesn't see him as a good risk to loan him money anyway. So you're taking all the risk. The bank takes none of the risk or the lender, the lending agency, whoever it is. And uh, it often, most often proves very costly. There is only one person that's been in this world that had a righteous surety ship. That's Jesus. You see, we had a debt that we couldn't pay, and we'd like to have it paid for. I, I want to be relieved of the guilt and the pressure of my sin, but I can't afford it. And I've tried to, tried to be a good person. It just doesn't work out. My flesh isn't working with me on that. It keeps messing up, you know. I've, I've tried to go to classes, you know, how to be the perfect person, uh, and then how to learn to be a a better person, I'll be more honest, I'll, I'll be this, I'll be that, I'll be the other thing. And, and Jesus let me know, you can't do it. I will pay for you. Now, in a co-signing situation, I want to pay the person back. With Jesus, it's like, you're not going to pay me back because you can't pay me back. You never can repay. And it is very costly. I'm laying down my life. That's how much I'm paying for you. He was surety for us. We had the debt of sin, and he became poor that we might become rich in him. He put aside the glories of his kingdom to come to earth and take on the form of a servant that we might reign with him and become a kingdom of priests with him. That blows my mind too. Ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. Wow. But if you're surety, if you want to be surety, if you want to co-sign, if you want to take on somebody else's debt, uh, you'll smart for it in two ways. One, you will get hurt. It'll be costly. And two, hopefully you get smart for it and you won't do that again. Or uh, uh, you'll hesitate to do that again and you won't happen a second time. So there is security in being responsible for your own debts, except for the fact that we can't pay for our own debt of sin, and we needed Jesus Christ to be surety for us. Then he goes on in verse 16, and he says, a gracious woman retains honor. We've had a lot of looks at the righteous woman in the form of wisdom, right? Calling you out to come to the Lord. And we've had a a lot of looks at the unrighteous woman back in chapters 5, 6, and 7. Do you remember? Uh, she had stolen bread, stolen waters, and those kinds of things. Uh, not even offering a banquet, just talking about stolen stuff, you know, secret things. But a, a, a gracious woman retains honor. The Hebrew woman of grace and favor. This reminds me, I always try to think of people that fit in these things. This reminds me of, of Ruth. She was gracious in her dealings and with her attitudes. She um, realized that she was in a tough situation. Do you remember when Naomi left the uh, land of Moab? She told her daughter-in-laws, Ruth and Orpah, we have a custom in Israel. You married into a Jewish family. 
That custom is called Leverite marriage. In other words, if your husband dies, his brother should take you on as his wife and raise up seed. Well, you know what? Uh, even if I were to get married today and I had a kid, by the time he gets old enough to be your marriage, to perform the Leverite marriage, you're going to be too old to have kids, so go home. And Orpha <clears throat> said, you're right, see ya. And we don't read about her again. But Ruth said, I love that line, do you remember? Your God will be my God. Where you lodge, I will lodge. I'm going with you. She knew it was going to be a tough life. They, they didn't have Social Security then. They didn't have anything like that. You can go out. The law provides for gleaning. One sixteenth of every farmer's field is left for poor people. But they got to go work for it. Nobody's going to glean for you and bring it to your side. I know you're poor. You're on welfare. So I'll bring the food to you. No. It's available. There's plenty to go around. But you got to go get it. You got to do something with it. So there's Ruth. She's out there working. She's not looking for a guy to take over for her. I'll just marry a rich guy and, and you know he can pay all my bills and provide the food for me. I'll have some service. No, she's working. And it was actually Naomi that realized the guy was interested in her because he sent some grain home. Say, here, take this home to your mother, uh, your mother-in-law. And she gets there and she goes, whoa, where were you today? This isn't normal gleaning. There's something going on here. And uh, so this, this is her. Uh, she had strength of character and she had honor. Do you remember that uh, when Boaz was talking to her, he told her, he said, you know what? Everybody in Bethlehem knows that you're a gracious woman. It, you're the talk of the town. Everybody knows. Wouldn't you love for everybody in Redlands to know that you're a gracious woman or a, an upright man with integrity? Wouldn't that be cool if the entire city knew that? That's what they knew about Ruth. Everybody knew about her. So she is a gracious woman who retained that honor. She didn't do anything to, to mess around or mess that up. And uh, it goes on here and says, but a ruthless, and that could be translated in the Hebrew, strong or mighty man retains riches. Now character and honor are important to the gracious woman. And the truth of that first line uh, is also seen in the story of Abigail. Do you remember Abigail? She was married to a guy named Nabal. And Nabal, Nabal was a, what's a nice word I can say about Nabal? The, the word he translated in Hebrew literally means fool. So I was going to say he's a jerk, he's an invisible. <clears throat> he was foolish, all right? He could be a nice guy, but he was a fool, all right? So David is protecting Nabal's flocks, David and his renegade band of men. And uh, it came time, they wanted some food. Nabal is shearing his sheep. There's usually a large feast. And so he sends some guys over and says, hey, uh, would you mind giving us some food? We never stole any of your sheep. We never took anything that was yours. Would you mind giving us some food? And Nabal's answer is amazing because he says, who is David? Like he didn't know who David was. And then to make sure that you knew who he was talking about, he said, who is the son of Jesse that I should give him? And, and he wasn't going to let him have anything. And, and when the word came back to David, he was angry. And David lost his temper and David was going to do something about it. But Abigail, Nabal's wife, had heard about it. And I love the description of Abigail in the story. Uh, it says that she was a uh, beautiful woman. She had a beautiful countenance and she was smart. She was smart and beautiful too. And so she went and put together the food and took it out to David, literally stopped David from making a mistake, from doing something he would regret later on. And uh, she went home and she told her husband about what she'd done. And he was so angry, he just sat there. And I, I think he probably had a stroke or something because he fell over dead <laughs> after a few days. And uh, David heard about it, sent out word and said, hey, wanna come hang out with me? <laughs> So she did. But the strength of character enabled her to attain honor from David and from his men. So strength of body enables a person to gain his or her wealth when others would try to seize it. 
Nabal's family would have lost everything. Abigail probably would have been killed in the mess too. She was able to retain that. She was strong enough. Now, some believe the ruthless man is the one who doesn't care about anything but money because a cursory reading of this says the strong man retains riches. But uh, others don't see this in such a negative light. It simply speaks of the reward that comes from being strong. I think David is an example of the second line. Do you remember there was a time in 1 Samuel 30 when some other soldiers, his own men, were jealous of him, and yet he was able to maintain and retain the control of that army clear on up to the kingdom. He's an example of that second line. Many believe the idea of this proverb can be a comparison rather than a contrast. We're looking for contrast, but there's also comparison. So the idea being that a gracious woman will defend honor with the same strength and persistency as a violent man would retain riches. And Boaz reminds me of the guy on the other side of this verse, a strong man that retains riches. He was strong in the Lord. He, he was a, a, a leader. Verse 17, the merciful man does good for his own soul, but he who is cruel troubles his own flesh. This again is the sowing and reaping principle we see throughout scripture. The one who shows mercy to others will be shown mercy. Second Samuel, uh, David is quoted as saying, with the merciful, you show yourself merciful. So the kindness smoke, spoken, the kindness spoken of is steadfast love like God's love to us. Jesus in the New Testament said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You want mercy? I do. Yes. I, I want mercy. So you want mercy? Be merciful. So what you want to reap. So what you want to get. The one who's unmerciful, in the other part of this verse, is cruel to others, and he troubles himself. If you're cruel to others, if you're uh, agitated by other people, if your attitude is bad against certain people, it's not going to necessarily hurt them as much as it's going to hurt you. I don't like that person. They don't care. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm agitated. I'm irritated. I'm getting high blood pressure, and I may have a stroke. <laughs> It'll kill you eventually. It's troubling your own flesh. We're warned in Matthew 7, judge not lest you be judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. you is that what you want to pour out? That's what you're going to get back. Now, verses 18 through 21 are a contrast between sin and righteousness again. The wicked man does deceptive work. When someone works deceptively, of course, it's dishonest and uh, evidence of wickedness. I want my work to honor God. Even when the boss is not around, I'm, I want to honor God. He's my boss. He's who I really work for. But he who sows righteousness will have a sure reward. Those who work righteously, marked by honesty and integrity, will see the reward of their work. Verse 19, as righteousness leads to life, the path of righteousness is the path of life. Righteousness, that right standing relationship with Jesus Christ leads to eternal life. Everybody's going to live forever, but we're going to live in the presence of God. Do things that are right. Do what a Christian, a Christ-like person is supposed to do. And we'll have eternal life because of Christ's righteousness becoming our own. But the wicked are pursuing evil to their own death. Verse, the other part of verse 19, he who pursues evil pursues it to his own death. Literally, they are going after their own life. I'm going to hurt myself. I'm going to destroy myself. And I'm going to lose my life. Verse 20. Those who are of a perverse heart are an abomination to the Lord. A perverse person is one who persists in pursuing evil. You, you may have met some of those people. They're just mean all the time. And uh, even though he or she knows how it's going to end, they continue on with it. And God is right because of his word and because of his righteousness to regard the perverse man uh, the heart of a man as an abomination before him but the blameless in their ways are his delight now a blameless person is not necessarily sinless i'm blameless because of the blood of jesus christ i'm not sinless but i'm blameless 
and, and I want to deal with sin appropriately, I take it to Jesus Christ. I delight in the Lord, especially from a new covenant perspective. We see that uh, the blameless in their ways are those who have been forgiven, declared righteous because of the person and work of Jesus Christ. And those are they who he delights in. He delights in them like he delights in his own son. I want to be his delight. I, it sounds strange. I want the Lord to look down at me and go, how delightful. <laughs> I, I like that. It's delightful. I don't think that's a word that people use a lot these days, but I want to be his delight. Verse 21. This is a powerful verse, and this keeps coming up in our world today. Though they join forces, the wicked will not go unpunished. But the posterity of the righteous will be delivered. That, that phrase there, join forces, is also translated, though they join hand to hand, though they get together, though they decide to work together against somebody or something, ungodly or unrighteous, though they do that, and they might seem to get away with it, and though they might seem to feel like they have that power or that authority, it's not going to be fruitful in the end. There are people who go through certain situations in life and they will join hands with others. Hey, you know this person? I don't like them. You, you don't like them either, do you? Uh, join with me. We, we need to let people know that they're not a good person. We can find somebody else to join with us. We'll join hands. We'll, we'll do things to make their life difficult because I don't like them. Or they've made my life difficult in some way or another. This is exactly what happened at the Tower of Babel. They joined hands. We're going to build a tower. God's in heaven. We're going to build the tower to heaven. We're going to be where he is. And he said, mm, not going to prosper. <laughs> and it all fell apart. Uh, by the way, here's a little rabbit trail that I go on every now and then. We're almost at that place again where everybody can communicate. <laughs> right? Yeah. We've got translation devices. Somebody gave me a thing the other day. You stick it in your ear, you speak in English, they speak in Spanish or Japanese or Arabic, and you hear it in your ear in English. That's amazing. And the computers do that. You got Babel online or whatever. You know, you type in the sentence, it comes back out in the other language. And, and you can use it. So we're almost back at the place where everybody was talking to each other before the Lord said, I'm done. So I'm wondering... I think we're still at, right at that place where the Lord's going to go, I'm done. This is over. But uh, we will not join hands. I don't want to join hands with the world. I want to stand up for Christ. I'm going to join hands with believers. Because the world wants me to join hands with them. Come on. Don't be so old school. Don't be so Victorian. Don't be so stick in the mud. This is what we are all doing. Everybody's doing it. No, they're not. Well, everybody I know is doing it. Well, you know the wrong people. They're not going to be unpunished, but the upright are going to be taken care of. The posterity of the righteous will be delivered. God's blessing will be upon his righteous ones and upon their descendants, their posterity. It doesn't always seem like it, especially in the middle of the world that we live in right now. But I always like to tell people, I've read the end of the book. It's going to be okay. You know, God's blessing will be upon his righteous ones. Here's a fun one. Solomon is going to use a humorous and absurd word picture here. As a ring of gold in a swine's snout, so is a lovely woman who lacks discretion. Did that picture come into your head? Some little pig with a big gold ring in his nose rolling around in the mud. It's not even shiny anymore. It's covered with gunk. Not just mud either. It's whatever's coming out of his nose, you know, how pigs are. Have you ever seen something like that? I would suggest that you can go down to Hollywood. There's all kinds of <laughs> pigs with gold rings in their noses. All right. <laughs> Beautiful women without discretion. It's the same difference. The word for lacks discretion here is literally uh, can be translated taste. Mm -hmm. Lacks taste. Uh, it can mean a physical taste. It can mean intellectual discretion, like Abigail had. Okay? Uh, 
It can mean ethical judgment. There isn't any. So here the description is a woman with no moral sensibility, no uh, propriety, unchaste. She's abandoned discretion. And what a waste of loveliness. So beautiful, but not attractive. We can be attracted by beauty, but you have to look at it long enough to realize that uh, may not be what you see at first. It doesn't fit. What amazes me is that women who are filled with the Spirit become much more beautiful than women apart from the Spirit of God. An amazing thing. Anyhow, he goes on and says in verse 23, the desire of the righteous is only good. They want to see good things happen. They want good things to happen to other people. They want to enjoy others' successes. They desire what is well-pleasing to God. But the expectation of the wicked is wrath. They uh, desire what is not pleasing to God. They want to see people destroyed. They want to get even or more than even, you know. I, part of the Old Testament law that I find fascinating is an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Mm -hmm. ah, that sounds pretty horrible. No, it's a limitation. Mm -hmm. If I poke out your eye, you can't take off my head. You can only poke out my eye, <laughs> all right? If I knock out your tooth, that doesn't mean you get to cut my throat. It means you can knock out my tooth. That's the limitation. Do I want to go the limitation? No, I want to be gracious. I want to be forgiving. I, I uh, You knocked out my tooth. I, I have the right to take your tooth, but I'm not going to. I want to be forgiving, okay? But uh, there are people who want to see other people fall. They want to see other people hurt. They hurt me, I'm going to hurt them. They hurt me a little bit, I'm going to hurt them a lot. I'm going to make them pay. You ever heard no, you don't hang around people that say stuff like that. <laughs> the desire of the righteous will be fulfilled, <laughs> and what is due to the wicked will come to them. It's going to happen. Now, we come to three Proverbs here, 24, 25, and 26, regarding giving, which is not loss. When you think about giving something to somebody, I don't know why, but the first thing that comes to my mind is, I gotta go to somebody's wedding, they're gonna expect a present, so I'm gonna give, spend so much money and I gotta take that out of my budget. Uh, are they really gonna use this or is it gonna get re-gifted five years from now at somebody else's <laughs> wedding? Or, the, or a, a present, yeah, we're going, we got invited to this dinner. If it's my grandkids, yeah, I'll, I'll buy whatever they need, whatever they want, whatever drives their parents crazy, you know. <laughs> but, uh, just somebody's birthday, do I gotta get them a $25 gift card? Won't a $5 Dairy Queen card do or something like that? We think of loss. Giving is loss, right? But that's not scriptural giving. That's not biblical giving because what he's going to talk about here is giving that is not loss, giving that is gain because you can't outgive God. There is one who scatters yet increases more. Well, that's not logical and there is one who withholds more than right but it leads to poverty well come on he's just looking out for the future he's storing up he's he's being prepared you know well ironically the possessions of a generous giver the one who scatters typically increase though he gives a lot of it away the possessions of the selfish person normally decrease even though he retains or withholds it. This is God's law of giving. This is biblical generosity, which is like the scattering of seed that will bring in a great harvest later. He says in several places in Scripture, Give and it shall be given unto you. He says, He that sows sparingly shall reap sparingly. And he that sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. And in another place it says, The same measure that you use will be measured back to you. And another place, uh, given it'll be measured down, pressed together, and overflowing. Now, that's the crazy thing. Sometimes you give a little bit, and it seems if, if you've uh, got to give something away, you're not going to give away as much as you're going to get. It keeps coming back. This happens to us every time we go to Mexico. Anybody that's been there will, will verify this. We go down to Mexico because we're wealthy Americans, right? Maybe you don't have a lot of money, but compared to some of the Mexicans we go down and visit, we're wealthy. We're Americans. I think I told you about the kid that almost drove me crazy. 
First thing he says to me when we get there is, Donde me regalo? Where's my gift? What'd you bring me? <laughs> what? Well, you're from America, man. You got everything. What'd you bring me? So we started giving to the churches so they get it from the church, not from the Americans, right? But uh, we go down to give, we go down to serve, and every single time we come back home and somebody always says, wow, I got more than I gave. I got so blessed. I got so filled. I got so ministered to. I gave more than I got. <laughs> Crazy. That's the Lord's accounting. Uh, it seems illogical, but the Lord's promise is when you're giving, you will get back. Like planting a field. You plant a little bit of corn, you're only going to get a little bit of corn. You plant a lot of corn, you're going to get a lot of corn. And uh, you're going to have fields full coming back. There's a poem I found that I kind of like. It was written by John Bunyan. Do you remember John Bunyan? He's the guy that wrote Pilgrim's Progress. And uh, he wrote this, and I thought it was appropriate. It says, A man there was, though some thought him mad. The more he cast away, the more he had. He that bestows his goods upon the poor shall have as much again and ten times more. <laughs> so as you give, as you're giving away, as you give, as you let the Lord lead you in your giving, I don't, I don't condone giving indiscriminately just because somebody asks. I get asked every day, hey man, I want a burger. Are you going to get a burger or are you going to go buy something else? So my policy has become, I'll buy you a burger, let's go. I can't tell you how many times I've been turned down because they didn't really want the burger. <laughs> they just wanted the cash, right? But I let the Lord lead in my giving and I find out that I can't outgive God. He will always give back. You will never lose being generous in the Lord's work. There's the one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. When we're selfish and ungenerous with what God has given us, we should expect God to grant us less. Uh, and it will lead to poverty. Now, a couple of more verses on the same subject. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. God promised to bless the generous soul. Most people are looking for a cash payout. What's my return on investment here? You know, It's not always cash. God can do that, but I've found that uh, some of us aren't real good with cash, and we get into trouble with it. We don't buy the burger. We've got to spend it on somebody, something else, you know. But God wants to bless us and give us riches. We have the greatest riches in the world. Righteousness, forgiveness, eternal life. The world can't come close to that. They can't touch it. But he often does both. So the generous soul in the, the Hebrew literally means the soul of blessing. The man who's blessing others, who blesses them, does good to them. The word for rich here in the Hebrew is literally fat. In the King James Version, you'll read, the liberal soul will be made fat. And that, that doesn't mean girth or something like that. It means abundance. It means full satisfaction. It can mean wealth. It can mean health. And he who waters will also be watered himself. When we give, God knows how to give to us. Can't water others without being watered ourselves. We are never the loser for God-guided generosity. And Jesus told us it's more blessed to give than to receive. Verse 26, the people will curse him who withholds grain, but blessings will be upon him who sells it. Uh, if you spend some time on this, it's mainly talking about manipulation of markets. We're gonna hold back goods till we can raise the price, then we'll let it. We see this going on every day, Wall Street and everywhere else. It's, it's a crazy game that a lot of people chase. But I, I think it means more than that. I think of Joseph in Egypt. He gathered the grain together, but he knew there was a famine coming and he knew that the people would need it. And he's the one that gave the grain. He gave it to the people. An example in scripture of one who held back again was Nabal. I'm not giving David anything. I got more than enough. I got plenty. I'm keeping it. I'm going to keep everything I've got. And uh, his wife went, oh, here's her description. She was a, a woman of good understanding and fair countenance. Isn't that cool? I like that description. But she stopped David from doing things he shouldn't do. So uh, Psalm 41, which we read before, 
uh, says, Blessed is he that considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in this time of trouble. You want to be delivered in time of trouble? Consider the poor. Help the poor. God takes a stand for poor people. We actually read where it says, The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he shall be blessed upon the earth, and thou wilt deliver him under the will of his enemies. Will, uh, okay. The Lord will strengthen him upon his bed of languish, and will make all his bed in sickness. Uh, Psalm 41, 3. So the Lord's going to take care of the man that's taking care of the poor. It's giving to God, and the Lord's going to return the blessing on you. Verse 27. He who earnestly seeks good finds favor, but trouble will come to him who seeks evil. It'll come upon him. Uh, a simple modern way of saying this is you get what you're looking for. God honors the one who seeks good. That one may be blessed with favor with God and among men, especially true when the good you're seeking is God himself. I can say personally, I was reading this verse this week and I'm thinking, this is me. There is weirdness going on all around me. In my life, you all, you all know people that are in weird situations. And uh, sometimes in the prayer meeting, we, we pray for people that have got nutty stuff going on in their life. And I think, you know, if I spend too much time staring at all the stuff that's going on around me, I could get really depressed. But I absolutely have no reason to be depressed. God is so good to me. God takes care of me. And I know it. I know it. Verse 28. He who trusts in his riches will fail or fall. One of the many warnings about the folly of trusting in riches for happiness and security and status, and that's what the world trusts riches for. I, I, I'll be happy if I'm rich. I'll be uh, secure if I'm rich. I believe some of the richest people in the world are less secure than poor people because it's like, Somebody's going to try and take my money. Where do I put this money? How do I keep it? If I keep it in cash, it, inflation is so high that I'll lose my money. But if I keep it in gold or silver, I'm not getting any uh, return on the investment again. You know what? What do I do with this stuff? And, and they lose a lot of sleep being concerned about those kinds of things. Uh, so Proverbs teaches us the value of money and wealth, but it also teaches us don't trust in it. It can do good things. But our trust is in the Lord. Another place, don't trust in horses. Don't trust in armies. I don't care how big your army is. God can take care of that. Riches are not going to keep you safe. And Proverbs has a lot to say about rich men. You've got to put your trust in the Lord because man's riches are temporal. Another place it says they make wings and fly away. Now, I've never seen a gold brick fly away, but I've seen it disappear. <laughs> They're not going to buy you anything with the Lord. They won't buy your way to heaven. They won't buy you out of hell. Part of the reason Martin Luther got so mad at the Catholic Church was in, uh, when they were building St. Peter's Basilica, they began to sell indulgences. All right? You sin, you come and pay the priest, he will pray for you, and we'll get you an insurance policy. Okay? That's what an indulgence is. Before you sin, come pay us, and go sin. It's already taken care of, right? You want to go commit adultery? Come pay the priest. He'll make sure you're forgiven before you commit adultery. You're going to go to a party tonight? You may get drunk. You, you don't know what's going to happen. I could die on the way home. I couldn't get to church and make confession, so I'll go ahead of time and get an indulgence. I'll pay for an indulgence. And they were raising money to build a building beautiful building. It's one of the nicest museums I've ever seen. I have yet to really see a church service going on in there. I was, most of you know I'm kind of a smart aleck, but I was, uh, they have all these little like naves with curtains in front of them and everything. And, and uh, I was with some other missionaries and I went into this church in, in, uh, we were in France and, uh, so I pulled up a chair and I'm sitting down in front of the curtain and this missionary comes up to me and goes, what are you doing here? I said, I'm, I'm waiting for the show. And I said, what? I said, well, it looks like there's gonna be a puppet show here. I'm, I'm waiting for the show. I said, get up, get out of here. What's the matter with you? Well, I'm a little twisted, that's what's the matter. But um, he who trusts 
in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like foliage. Uh, in the old King James, it says like a branch. I like foliage better. Righteous man or woman uh, does not trust in riches, but in the Lord. And the Lord will make you like a tree in full bloom. I'm going to be fruitful. That's what I want to be. I want to produce spiritual fruit. I want to be fruitful. He who troubles his own house, verse 29, will inherit the wind. Inherit the wind is a, a storm, a future storm and trouble. Wind represents being left with nothing. We've seen the destruction that tornadoes and hurricanes can cause. They just wipe stuff out. Wind is something that can't be grasped. I can't hold the wind. I can't control the wind. Uh, you're bringing trouble to your own family. You're bringing storm and difficulty. You'll have nothing because you'll be blown away. And the fool will be servant to the wise in heart. Because God's blessing is on the wise, God will lift up the wise of heart, and the foolish man or woman should fully expect to be working for the wise, because God's going to bless that way. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and again, the righteous tree bears fruit and gives life to others. The New Testament's later going to speak of the fruit of the Spirit in the life of God's people, Galatians 5.22 and Ephesians 5.9. This is the Christian by example. He attracts others to Christ. You see a tree full of fruit, you want to go up and check it out, don't you? I mean, if it's just got leaves and bushes, we've seen those, but what are those orange things hanging in there? Or those red things? Uh, uh, check it out. Hey, it's ripe. <laughs> Maybe I'll do more than check it out. He's a fruitful tree and a bountiful tree and draws others. And he who wins souls is wise. One of the greatest exercises of wisdom is to win souls to God in his kingdom. The Hebrew for winning souls can literally be translated catches souls. Remember we talked about the fowler a few weeks ago, the guy who catches birds? That's kind of the same illustration. He who is wise catches souls. He's going to use his gifts, his talents, his abilities to let other people know, to attract other people, to draw them in, to catch their soul. Because there's somebody else out there that's looking for souls too. He wants to catch souls, and it's not for anything good. So if you're ever looking for something to do and you want to do something wise, go win some souls for the king. Yes. <laughs> and while it's true that evangelistic soul winning is wise work, it's not all that this verse is talking about here. The idea is that the wise people influence others to follow the ways of wisdom. Yeah. Our world is influencing people in so many weird directions today. We're to be influencers for good, uh, including turning people to God for salvation. And in verse 31, it says, if the righteous will be recompensed on the earth, and we see that many times God's righteous men and women uh, see at least something of the reward of their righteousness while they're still on earth, the righteousness of a blessed life. Even in the middle of trial, I still know I'm blessed and I still know and in the end, I'm going to be better off than all these tormentors. How much more the ungodly and the sinner? The righteous are going to receive their reward, and often this is on the earth. But it's sobering if you meditate on this, if you think about it, how much more it's true of the ungodly and sinner. God will not overlook the deeds of the sinner. There will be a full penalty. I don't even like to think about it. But it's what's going to happen. So again, you can't outgive God. You give, he gives back to you. You want to give evil? If you're sowing that way, he'll give back to you. In abundance. They're giving out wickedness. They're giving out evil. They're giving out deceit, falseness, and death. Guess what they're going to get back? Just what they've sown. Same thing. And judgment is definitely coming. So again, it's a warning to each of us. Be careful what you sow. You've got good things. God has given you wonderful things to sow to the rest of the world around us. And what you sow is what you're going to reap. The Lord reminded me again of one of my favorite scriptures. And I wanted to end here tonight. It's Micah chapter 6, verse 8. We sing it on occasion. He has shown thee, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee. But to do justly and to love mercy 
and to walk humbly with your God. Let's say that together. You all know that one, right? He has shown thee, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. That's what we need to do. Let's all stand together.